Now Habersham is proud to sponsor interviews with the candidates for the May 24th political primaries. We hope by viewing these personal interviews, you'll get to know the candidates who will be making decisions that impact your life, your family, and your livelihood here at the local and state level in Georgia. We hope you'll vote May 24th, and we hope you'll be more informed in that process by hearing from the candidates themselves in these one-on-one -on -one interviews sponsored by Now Habersham. Welcome to Now Habersham. We're speaking this morning with Steve Campbell, the incumbent for the state court uh, job position here in Habersham County. Welcome to Now Habersham, Steve. Thanks, Dick. Well, let's start off and talk about your formal education. You've already been in this uh, position for some time, but a lot of people might, know, might not know what your background is. So tell us about your formal education. Sure. Um, I went to law school in North Carolina at Wake Forest University. Uh, that was back in the, I guess I graduated in 1986. I had, uh, I'm from Atlanta originally, but I, I met my wife when I came up to Habersham County to work as the law clerk for Judge Gunner and Judge Struble in Superior Court back in the late 80s, and uh, met Susan. I've lived in Cornelia uh, since 1991. We were married in May of 1992, and we are, have, I've lived in Cornelia ever since. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit of my background, educationally and personally. What about, uh experience and non-formal education, uh, career jobs and things like that, uh, uh, being an attorney, that uh, has an impact on your role as a judge? I think I've been very fortunate over time to have really experienced almost every type of matter you could deal with in a trial situation. Um, when I was the law clerk 20-something years ago, I was fortunate enough to have been involved to be involved in a death penalty case, a medical malpractice civil case, a, um, a, a habeas corpus case where the next to last person who was um, executed in the electric chair in Georgia was involved in a very horrendous set of facts. Um, so then I went on to go to Gainesville where I worked in insurance defense, so I did some defense trial work. When I came to Cornelia, I have done plaintiff's trial work and since 1993, or beginning in 1993, I was the solicitor of the state court, which means I'm the prosecutor of that court. And I did that um, until 2010 when Governor Perdue appointed me state court judge. Uh, I was on the ballot in 2012, did, had no opposition, and so have served as the judge since 2010 till currently um, in state court. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about some issues. Okay. Uh, what do you draw upon uh, in your life to determine the the, the penalty in a case of uh, jail time uh, that might be outside the recommended uh, sentence time uh, that's provided to you. Uh, in other words, if you feel like the sentence time, the auto automatic sentence time or minimum is, is too harsh in a given situation, how do you hand, how do you make decisions? What do you draw upon in, your, in yourself as a human being to decide those things? Well, I think a, a few things. I think that first of all, you know, everybody brings their own heart and their own head to the, to the equation and your experiences, and, and certainly I'm no different than anyone in terms of, you know, just I have that ability to look to myself and draw upon experiences I've had. Certainly my legal experiences is, is a big, big thing. I've been in state court a long time, and I've met, I believe, over 100,000 cases, or pretty getting on that now, over 24 years in state court. And knowing a little bit about people and getting to meet them and seeing how different people respond over the years, that informs me. Luckily in state court, there really aren't many cases where we have a mandatory sentence. Uh, the mandatory minimum sentence in a DUI case does exist. Um, I would say that usually any kind of change from that would normally be a little bit more than the mandatory minimum, but um, just to try to get a point across, but at the same time, uh, that's the primary one. There's also a mandatory minimum in suspended license cases, which I think can be very harsh if someone is eligible at that time to get their license back. So I try to steer them on a course to make sure that they get their license back and then we treat them a little you know, less harshly so that we can let them keep their license and hopefully move past this and become, you know, do what they're supposed to be doing and get off the, the, uh, the bad side of the law, so to speak. Mm -hmm. There's been a uh sort of movement around the United States and state judicial systems about sentencing of drug uh, cases. And we've seen our prisons in almost every state, uh, and, and this one included, uh, 
grow to the point that it's almost difficult to pay for the prison system for nonviolent drug users who are not uh, trafficking drugs but just have been caught or are in a situation where it was discovered. So well, how do you, what do you think is the solution um, in terms of rehabilitating rather than jail time? And it, depending on what you say about that, how do we pay for it? Well, let me just say that in state court, really the primary charge that would be in my court related to drugs would be possession of marijuana less than an ounce. And obviously there's a movement on in other states to decriminalize that. Um, it is still a crime in the state of Georgia to possess marijuana less than an ounce. It is a misdemeanor. The state provides something called a, a conditional discharge for a first-time drug possession offender that allows them to complete a sentence and upon successful completion of the sentence have the case discharged or dismissed so that it's not doesn't become part of their state record. We use that routinely because so many of these people are, are young people who, you know, okay, they've made, an, they've made an error. We're saying, okay, look, this is against the law. Here's some rules you're gonna have to follow. You're gonna have to have a drug and alcohol evaluation. You're gonna do some community service. You're gonna have to toe the line for a period of time. But if you do that successfully, then we're gonna let you come back and, and uh, have that case discharged. And of course, if you're back the second time, you wouldn't have that opportunity. So I really try to make sure the person understands, hey, here's a huge opportunity for you. Make sure you get this right. Don't mess it up. And you can go back to being a normal citizen because if you get convicted of that, it could disqualify you from all kinds of government and, and public jobs. Uh, student loans. Absolutely. That's a biggie That's under a federal law. So. Very much. And it's also a little bit difficult to put, uh, to me, uh, to put, uh, uh, say, a college student in jail for, as you say, under less than an ounce uh, for an activity that the state has given legal use to by a minor who's suffering from, say, a disease and requires a product of the marijuana plant. So that doesn't quite seem to drive, you know. Well, well, I think that I think the law does distinguish between the two. Currently, still does, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, I, and it sounds like to me this, in terms of where that that law is heading, that there's really no move on to decriminalize marijuana possession in, in Georgia. I think that the, you know, that the, that the, the, the medical marijuana law, um, I, I think that the way that I read the legislature's actions in that is really trying to draw parallel tracks so that they really don't converge. Um, where the law goes from here related to possession of marijuana, I don't know, but certainly I don't think Georgia's anywhere near Colorado and Washington at this point. Mm -hmm. So let's get to a touchy subject from the debate the other night yes. <laughs> here in Habersham County. Uh, your opponent, uh, right out of the gate, uh, asked you about your um, office uh, being elsewhere and your staff being elsewhere, uh, and that the office uh, for uh, the state court judge sits vacant. So um, how do you respond to the question about uh, first of all, not asking about your, your employment because you're, you're a practicing attorney and that's perfectly fine for the job you have. You can right. be a part-time job and part-time attorney. Right. And I don't know what else you would do if you were trying to live, you know, just being on the, the salary. Uh, so uh, how do you respond to this uh, business that you ought to be stationed seemingly a long time at the courthouse most days? Um, I, I guess I just view it as my opponent wanting to attack me and trying to find something that he can try to hang on me that he thinks is a problem. I have been practicing in this court, whether as the prosecutor or the judge, for going on 24 years, never had this issue come up. Um, I think that there is a human resources county issue which relates to how that matter has been handled internally there, which to me is has done nothing to change what the office does and how we operate. It's been the same as long as I've been doing it. It's a non-issue to me. Uh, I had the county manager has clarified that matter and I just think it's not an issue at all. Mm -hmm. Now you've, you've already uh, been the state uh, court judge. Uh, let me ask you a question about the future. How will uh, Caversham be a better place to live uh, with Steve uh, in this position? Dick, I can tell you that my goal as the state court judge is to provide a forum, a court, where people can have a fair hearing and they're treated fairly. I think that, you know, look, people are going to come to court and some people are going to like the results and some people aren't going to like them. I can never, you can't stop that. That's part of your job as a judge. You are making decisions. Some people aren't going to like all of them. Okay? I can live with that. 
But I think that most of the people who are practicing law in my court and who appear in my court know that I'm doing my utmost to be a fair judge, where integrity, the rule of law, and uh, just making sure that, that the parties are heard is primary in my court. I want people to very definitely understand exactly what's going on in court. In fact, I take time at the beginning of every court session to try to make sure that people understand what we're doing here today, why we're doing it, why when they are, um, when they are pleading guilty to a case, what very important constitutional rights they are waiving when they plead guilty or no contest to a case. And I take a lot of time to make sure that happens. I do want to say one thing. I, I think that, you know, back in 2015, I was serving both as a state court judge and the interim probate judge in Habersham County. And there were times when I was having to balance two judge jobs at the same time. And I would have to go in one court and be back in the other, and, and that happened on several occasions. But I can tell you right now that I take um, my court uh, and how it's handled with the utmost seriousness. I want every person who comes there to be treated fairly, to feel like you know, that they are respected because they are. I don't care where you come from, what your background is, what you know, it doesn't matter. It's all about making sure that that person uh, receives a fair hearing. My goal is to listen all the way through in every case, and I think I do that, and I think the people who know me and know my court know that that's what I do, that it's a fair place to get a hearing. We've been visiting with Steve Campbell, uh, incumbent and uh, for the state court judge position here in Habersham County. Steve, we wish you the best of luck. Thanks, Dick. Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Dick Stafford. Welcome to Now Habersham. This afternoon, we're visiting with Rob Kiker, candidate for state court judge of Habersham County. Welcome, Rob. Good afternoon. To Now Habersham. Let's start off with just talking a little bit about your credentials and your formal education. What uh, has prepared you uh, for the position of state court judge? Well, of course, for state court judge, you have to be an attorney licensed in the state of Georgia. Uh, I believe it's minimum five years experience. I have 29 years of experience, uh, both in civil and criminal trial practice. Uh, also, it was the county attorney for Habersham County for 17 years before the chief judge of the circuit decided I would make a uh, interim commissioner and I was appointed to that position, did not run for re-election. And after that, I was the county attorney for Towns County for seven years while still maintaining a trial practice. Wow. What about informal um, experience? Things not associated, um, hobbies, interests, volunteer, things that you participated in that uh, might influence your decisions uh, as a state court judge. What kind of experiences have you had uh, that maybe prepare you uh, for your job? Well, um, <clears throat> activities, things that are not formally. Formally legal right. related, yeah. right. Um, I am uh, a active duty uh, officer as a JAG officer. Uh, I uh, have drilled at uh, Clay National Guard Center. Uh, so I serve my state as a, as a commissioned officer. Um, I'm the father of five children. And so uh, from 32 years of age down to seven months. And so um, I think that in raising children and bringing them through the, the school system, through the community, uh, the morals, the, the philosophies, the, uh, the teaching them to, to be good and productive uh, members of society. And all of my children who are grown are productive members of society. I'm very proud of them. And so therefore, um, you know, that life experience has a lot, uh, offers a lot. What do you think are the greatest obstacles to justice in a rural town like Habersham County? Well, you have, a, I think, the greatest threat to any community, but it seems more so to rural communities is the drug problem. Mm -hmm. And that comes from poverty to a large degree, uh, from uh, lack of opportunities, and of course that's always something people talk about in rural counties, Habersham County included. Uh, lack of opportunities and not much a judge can do about that, but that does foster those problems. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a technical judicial question. Sure. <laughs> and uh, what criteria do you use for deciding whether to impose or affirm sentences outside of standard, um, standard ranges as a judge? Well, of course, in I the think state. You're required. 
are you required to be within the well, there, minimum? there are some minimum mm -hmm. uh, sentences. For instance, DUIs, you mm -hmm. have minimum service time. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have maximum time, 12 months for most of the cases or all of the cases, criminal cases in state court mm -hmm. or misdemeanor cases. So therefore, you have maximum sentences, maximum fines, uh, generally 12 months, $1,000 fine, plus surcharges. What you do is you take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you know, some uh, cases warrant uh, more punishment than others, and that's why you don't have a computer doing the job, why you don't have a printout. It's why you have a person. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, for a judge, in this particular situation, and, and judges in general, it's not so much legal background and experience, it's temperament mm -hmm. and judgment and respect. Mm -hmm. And I think those are very important qualities for a judge. Mm -hmm. Now this, uh, the state court judge is a, a part-time uh, appointment, not appointment, election position. So how does that work with your outside work as an attorney and do you have time to do this? Well, actually, um, you know, when you say part-time, it's a good it's a it's a good question because the pay is 80 percent of a superior court judge within circuit mm -hmm. and therefore uh, it would be my opinion that a uh, elected judge ought to spend somewhere around that amount of time on the judgeship so yes it would curtail your private practice and cause you to spend more time as the judge because you're paid superior court judge is full time mm -hmm. so therefore 80 percent is mm -hmm. pretty easy to do the math mm -hmm. Uh, how long have you lived in Habersham County, and um, what volunteer or other activities do you participate in to give people a chance to know a little bit more about you who may not know you? Most, most people know you, but some people may not. Right. Um, I've been in Habersham County over 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, all of my children uh, born and raised here. Um, I was one of the founding members of the Sunrise Rotary Club. It's now the Clarksville Rotary mm -hmm. Club. I had pres um, uh, done some volunteer work through my church, and uh, most of my outside activities have to do with the military service. Mm -hmm. You were, did you say a JAG? JAG attorney? officer, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent have you practiced law in your, in your practice, uh, criminal law, family law, uh, civil litigation? What is, has been your area of specialty? A lot of government law, mm -hmm. but also uh, criminal defense and some prosecution as a county attorney and then also uh, civil litigation, general civil litigation. Could one have goals for the judicial system in Habersham County, and if so, what are yours? Yes, definitely. The, my uh, opponent, the sitting judge, uh, we had a debate or a forum last night, and uh, we have each expressed our, our viewpoints. And I think, from what I understand is, you know, he's saying this is how we've always done it and this is how we need to continue to do it. I want to make some definite changes in the court. And what would those be? Well, <clears throat> the pay is now 80% of the Superior Court judge, so I think more time should be spent in the courthouse. Back when the judgeship started, we did not have room in the courthouse for the state court judge. Of course, now the taxpayers built a multi-million dollar judicial center, and uh, that was to house all the, the courts, including the state court, and it has offices designated which are not utilized or I, I would submit underutilized and um, also in 2014 February 2014 the current judge asked for a, a 40 hour a week secretary to be paid a salary with all benefits uh, as has been in the past uh, that secretary is located in his law office I think that secretary needs to be moved to the county courthouse where there's an office for the secretary of the state court judge and make it a more functional uh, and hands-on uh, state court. Do you believe judges should be required to report attorney misconduct? Actually, they are. Um, if a, if a um, well, I say that now. <clears throat> if a judge witnesses attorney misconduct, then they have an affirmative duty to report that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, hearsay or someone said, uh, of course, um, that's something that they, if they choose, if the conduct is serious enough, serious enough then they can uh, actually look to an investigator or have it investigated. Uh, does the state court judge uh, have prerogative in deciding how much time uh, is going to be spent on civil cases versus criminal cases in terms of, uh, like, say, a, a clerk would be trying to balance that uh, in, in the docket or in the plans, the calendar? Uh, 
Is that an issue? It, it is. Um, the criminal cases come because they come. Mm -hmm. It's the cases are made by the sheriff or other law mm -hmm. enforcement, uh, forwarded through the solicitor's office and then back through the clerk's office for scheduling of trial or hearings, plea arraignments, and uh, various uh, functions. Um, in that capacity, that's, that uh, calendar will be what it is. Now, as far as the civil calendar goes, that's something that the judge has more control over. And I think that the court is underutilized in that way. We have four pending cases in civil, on the civil calendar on state court since 2013. The superior court judges are very busy on their civil calendars. You can look at them and there's maybe in the hundreds have come through during the last few years. The state court has concurrent jurisdiction with the superior courts on several of the uh, matters. So the state court is underutilized for that purpose and could release some of the pressure from the superior courts for trials. Mm -hmm. Why does uh, uh, a person who's planning to file a civil lawsuit, why do they choose superior court over magistrate court or vice versa? If you're filing a complaint against another well, well, there are certain uh, exclusive and concurrent jurisdictions. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, dispossessories, things like that, go mm -hmm. to Maastricht Court. Uh, Superior Court has equitable and uh, real estate, mm -hmm. matters to real property, and also matters as to divorce and child custody. The state court kind of fits there in there in between. Uh, collection, work. Um, some damage cases and all could be filed in the state court. So I was just wondering if some of that can be changed around or not. It could. Uh, the problem is when you don't have an operating state court office in the courthouse, you know, it's kind of like having a restaurant with your doors closed and locked. You know, no one's going to come visit. Um, if you were elected uh, to the state court judge position, how would it, how would Haversham County judicial system be different if Rob Kiker was in that spot? I would untangle the private and public uh, situation that has always existed, okay? <clears throat> but the, the, the court now has a budget in excess of $250,000. And I think as long as you have your, your county employee working in your law practice, you still have some of the funds being uh, designated to a location other than the courthouse. You don't know what your assets are. You don't know how to utilize them. I would think you would separate those. Uh, make your private practice, if you maintain one, separate from your state court practice, and then therefore uh, be able to better utilize the assets and money assigned to you by the taxpayers. We've been visiting with Rob Kiker, uh, candidate for state court judge in Haversham County. Good luck, Thank Rob. you. Thank All right, you. glad Appreciate to have it. you. Thank you. We hope you've benefited from these interviews sponsored by Now Habersham. And we want to remind you, be sure to vote May 24th.